Bam is a communications agency that believes stories move the world. We move stories forward for technology-driven brands that challenge, change, and create entire industries. Today on Dear Bam, we're talking to PeerFit to Vice President of Marketing, Maria Wan. Maria is an artist at heart and analyzer at her core. She combines two creative and analytical methods to generate unique campaigns and initiatives to reach audiences. Let's dive in. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Dear Bamp, the podcast for marketing and PR pros such as yourself. Today, we have the lovely Marie Wan on with us from PeerFit. We're going to talk about some health tech oriented medical conversations, questions that you guys have sent in specifically for this. Maria, thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This is great. Let's dive right in. First question here. Dear Banff, we have a new partnership announcing a pilot with a large partner, but it's a very small sample size and data won't be available for one year. How can we maximize this news? I'm sure you've seen stuff like this before, Maria. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And we, we've we experienced this quite a bit because we work directly with a lot of large partners in the healthcare space. And so a lot of times we have to go through all the legalese and many departments before we can even get anything approved or pushed out. So for us, this is something that we deal with all the time. You know, the thing that we always try to do is, is work on collaborating directly with the partner so that they feel and see the value of the partnership. Because sometimes you might end up, the person you ended up making the deal with may not be the person that ends up helping you with the marketing part of it. Um, so I always talk about, you know, making sure that there's a collaboration, uh, a mutual collaboration between the two. And then I always think about, you know, even though you're working with a small sample size or it may be a, a pilot, really think about what's going to be the benefit on a large scale. And that's the stuff that you want to put out right in the beginning. What's the future impact that you want to address and what problems are you trying to solve, even with a pilot, even with a small sample size? And then once it's launched, you gather the great data, you gather some testimonials, and that's going to be the opportunity for the follow-up. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've seen this a number of times on the health tech side too, where and sometimes it's just frankly the disease you're dealing with. If it's something like that, if there's just n- there's not thousands of people to test on, that can just be the reality. What have you seen as this person is saying, yeah, it's not going to be available for one year? Do you have anything you do in between that time? Have you ever done announcements or or just little like updates, anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even if you know, you think that the small sample size and the data won't be available for you. There's got to be something that you can really look at from a, you know, a first, a, you know, quarter or the first 90 days. You know, if you can start to pull something out where you can start releasing little nuggets of information, even if it's not the full scope of the data that you were hoping to push out, even something like that can really um, start to at least like little leave little crumbs along the way. And what we usually do is if it can't be a full-blown press release or pitch, you know, maybe it's just nuggets of information released via some, some channels, whether that be social or, or your email, just so you're continuing to push out little pieces of information along the way that can eventually become that larger story. We've also seen too, where you just loop it in as a reminder that this trial is going on. So if there's some news jacking opportunity, there's some thought leadership piece that you're touting about the importance of finding this information for the future of, let's say it's a disease prevention, something like that. Oh, by the way, this trial has been launched since this date with this partner. Like You just can loop it back in, in uh, other forms of your messaging to remind people that this is going on and how it has significance. Yeah, absolutely. And even then, when you're continuing to push out those little pieces of information, that pilot might end up, it could end up being expanded, right? Because if you're starting to show successes early on, you know, there's an opportunity there to expand those pilot and expand that sample size. That's true. And if you're also buttering up this partner, perhaps yes. along the way, and you're pushing out the information. Once you have all the information, now they're poised to go, oh, yeah, go right ahead. Let's do make a press push because they've been seeing the crumbles that have come. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's always about providing the information before they ask for it, I think. you always got to gotta keep them kind of wanting more. Mm-hmm. Okay. Let's go to our next question then. Dear Banff, our product requires a medical expert prescribe use, so it's this prescription here, and we have limited samples to share with press. How can we give the media a better idea of how our product is used 
and what the patient experience is like. So basically this person's dealing with, it's prescription only, and you need a medical head honcho to do this. So how are you going to talk about results, et cetera? Yeah. And I think, I think the key word there for me in that question was what's the experience going to be like for the patient, right? And so you've got to get that validation and you've got to get something to create that story arc out of. And so I always think, listen, if you can't give someone a tangible product in hand, how can you create the experience for them in some other way? So I always think about, you know, can you get some patient testimonials and stories? Can you work up some visuals to show how the product will work? Or, you know, whether it's a prescription or whether it's something that, you know, only a certain types of individuals can take, we can still create some kind of visual representation so that they understand how the product will work. You know, think of the patient journey. How can you map that out and create it with the story arc between the testimonials and the visualization of the product that will create that entire experience for the press to see, even though they can't physically take it. So it's all about selling that experience and providing a really defined way of showing that. Have you, or would you consider perhaps bringing in the physician in any way, shape or form? I know this has some some issues just from that perspective of clearance and things like that. But yeah, what would, what would you say to that? You know, I think the question here is not would I, but would they, right? Because a lot of times you may ask, but you may not get that reciprocation that they would want to participate. And same thing with patient testimonials. I mean, how often had, have we asked users and members and patients for testimonials and stories and just have heard nothing, right? So, I mean, I think you have to try every avenue to get responses back. Um, if you don't try, you know you're definitely going to get a no, but definitely you've got to try to to get that full kind of 360 view. And so absolutely, the, the physician would be one of the first people I would ask in order to provide that. And, and the hope is that they would be willing to participate along with along with a patient so you can get that full scope. Mm-hmm. Okay. Next question here, dear Banff, how do you PR the PR internally? When some of your executive team just doesn't get why PR is valuable for the business, and especially now when over-communication is so important amid this pandemic. This is a general one that I think a lot of people can relate to. Yeah, and I think it's a great question because as marketers, not only are we always trying to sell to our customers, but we're also trying to kind of sell ourselves, right, to our own organization. Yeah, yeah. We're always yeah. trying to show our value. And so I think the biggest thing is you got to get them involved right? You've got to use your leadership team and your C-suite. They need to be your spokespeople and your representatives. You know, when they feel like they're involved in the messaging and have to be the one to actually relay the information, they'll see how important it is to have a straight, strong PR presence, whether it's internally to your organization or even externally out to the, to the press, you know, and I think that's definitely one way to look at it. Another aspect is, you know, you got to show them what your competitors are doing. You got to compare apples to apples, right? And and show like, hey, look, our competitor over there in the space is doing all this PR and we're not doing much. We've got to at least be able to compete on that level. And so I think that's a, that's another really strong way to show them the value of PR, just to make sure that you everyone's on an even playing field. You've got to be able to want to invest in that. And I find, you know, when you are a marketing and PR department who's focused on building an internal like media company within your organization, using your leadership and C-suite and the expertise that they have, that makes it a lot easier to promote your organization because everyone's a representative. Everyone is the branding is everyone is the brand for the organization when everyone is involved with pushing it out. I'm definitely down with the third party use of data here. Mm -hmm. Nothing sells more compellingly to data focused, objectively focused executives than here is what tangibly competition is doing leads are doing. And there's the great thing is, and we use all these tools, et cetera, is you can see a lot now. You can understand and get a whole swath of information about what competitors are doing in the marketplace, mm -hmm. whether it be just on what they're getting media footprint wise, what their article reach and shares are like, et cetera, traffic, you can get a lot of insight into. So there's stuff to dig up. And what we have found is for anyone who's kind of, eh, you know, not on board, it seems so fluffy. You drop some of this stuff to them, mm -hmm. it suddenly becomes more clear and more compelling. And I'm hard pressed to see an executive to this point who says, yeah, oh, those, those competitors, th they're doing really great. Oh, 
Um, you know, that's okay. Like, whatever, we'll just stay over here. Like, that is not so much what we've seen, at least. People go, ooh, okay, gosh. If now I'm going to look bad because I'm not taking advantage of this, shoot, not good, not good. So to this person who wrote in, yeah, you, you PR, your PR by showing the metrics and the data that you can, especially when it's objective third-party stuff. Absolutely. And everything's trackable. Have you guys seen that over at Fear Pit? Yeah, we just look at too, is I try and think about how to measure that from how things are coming in, right? Like you say, we can track everything now. You can track traffic, you can see where people are coming in from. So you can put a measured value on pretty much anything that you push out based on the traffic that's coming in from whatever source. So if if, if it becomes where they need to see an ROI and they want to put a dollar amount to it, that's easily done because everything can be tracked in this day and age. Mm -hmm. Which is great. Makes our jobs easier. Okay. Let's get to our next one. We got storytelling here. So dear Banff, storytelling is rooted in strong messaging. We know that when your client or a business unit can't align on messaging and it starts to delay a campaign, how do you work around that? Ooh, yeah. I mean, this pretty much happens to us all the time, right? Because we're, we're departments working with other departments. And so what I always like to do, and this is a little bit cart before the horse, um, but it works every single time, which is pitch with visuals, right? Some people just need that visual representation first before you align on the messaging. And so that's what we try and always do is just let's let's figure out what we think we want it to look like visually. And, and underneath that, you know, we are thinking about what that message and tone will be. But um, I feel like that always helps resonate because the imagery can be very strong. Oh, so you almost do or would suggest here, not like a lookbook, but just a vision board type of approach and say, hey, do we like this? Is this where we're headed? Yeah, yeah. And I think working with your design team or if you have like external designers, you know, if you can't align on the messaging, because I always, of course, love to start with copy first. I think that's the best way to do it. But I know that not everybody else can think that way, right? I know that that's not always where people's heads are at. So sometimes I do have to bring in my design team and say, hey, guys, we've got to start with visuals first because it's not, we're, we're not, we're not hitting the mark where we need to be. So sometimes, you know, even if we have to throw some Lauren Itson in there, just some placeholder copy, sometimes seeing how it will lay out visually or how it will be represented visually might help hone in on what the message needs to be, might help narrow their thoughts a little bit more. Hmm. Yeah, much more of a design approach. Mm -hmm. I like that. And have you used that recently? Or have you seen traction with that specifically? Yeah, I think for us, so we just recently launched a new, it's not necessarily a new product, but we decided to go ahead and kind of finalize a product, which was PureFit Digital, which is our fully digital product that we're launching. And that was something that we really had to figure out as we weren't exactly sure, you know, what kind of message we wanted to push. So we thought, okay, let's start with how we want it to lay out and how we want it to, to be visually represented. And then from there, we finalized the copy based on all of us coming together once we could see how it would be visually represented externally. Hmm. And with this, with kind of this visual approach, did it naturally have people comments say things, oh, th those images, here are the words that come to me when I see that, oh, strong, powerful, or uh, persuasive, intelligent, like do, do words just kind of topple out or tumble out of people's mouths when they see things? Yeah, I think if we start with an approach like this, it's because we can't align on the messaging, right? So hopefully, by the time we get to this point, everybody has their idea of what they want the message to be. I think what happens when we start putting this first is then from here, it just helps narrow it down a little bit more like, hey, this is the, the general direction we want to go in. But definitely, it, it also helps just kind of compromise. So maybe if somebody is thinking one thing and, and another person thinking another thing, that we can find that middle ground between the two once we all kind of see visually how it's going to be represented. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question here. This is kind of the big question. So let's see what you think. Dear Bam, some healthcare businesses are set up to thrive during the pandemic. How do you promote yourself and company news without being viewed as tone deaf? We've had lots of questions kind of surrounding this. Yeah, no one has escaped the effects of this pandemic, right? Not even Zoom, right? Every, everyone's been affected in some way, shape or form, good or bad. You know, I think at the end of the day, it all goes back to empathy. You have to think about everything you push out, how it's going to be perceived and interpreted and that you have to be really thoughtful about everything you push out. 
I definitely love to hear that um, other businesses are having successes and and I want to hear that for sure. But I also want to hear how they got there during this time, right? So don't just be compelled to share how great you're doing, but show me all the work that you did to get to that great end result. Because that's the kind of thing that I think a lot of people are looking for right now is they're looking for guidance. They're looking for new ways to do things because everybody wants to try and strive or survive and and potentially thrive right now. And so anything that you can do to provide helpful tips and hints and show how you're helping um, is going to be huge right now. And I think it just all goes back to being empathetic to, to your, to your listeners. I have found, I just wrote an an ad age article on this and we've done some webinars for some funds about this of, and, and dealing even with the guilt, I think some companies have a bit of, oh gosh, you know, we're actually really benefiting right now in healthcare or not, you know, we're, we're benefiting right now. Things are going really well. You know, are we profiting from this whole thing? Oh my gosh, we are, you know, we're hiring. I mean, like there's all these interesting winners in this time and there's a lot of psychological stuff that falls into play, all this stuff. Anyway, one thing to really consider is, is it authentic to your brand mm-hmm. to vo- in, in what way to message? So does it sound or is it on par with wh- what goes back to your brand? So for example, if transparency is part of your brand ethos or something like care, kindness, is that part of your ethos then? Always going back to your roots and making sure that that stays in alignment is solid and definitely required. And then to your point, which I think is great, is... Instead of, we are winning right now, company X, mm-hmm. who else have you helped? And going all, drilling all the way down to the, the end, quote unquote, winner yeah. and who's benefited. So if it's that patient, if it's the family of the patient, if it's the child of the patient, whatever, the teacher, like the end user who wins because of this or has tremendous benefit and to highlight that instead of, Oh, look at us. We did this. It's more about put, put them as the showcase, put them on the pedestal of how this technology or how your platform or et cetera has helped them have a great team or save that person or give confidence to the family about what they're doing moving forward. I just had this conversation with a couple of startups that are in the death space and they're like, Oh God, you know, we're doing actually really well right now. And and actually that was one of our questions too, that came through on this podcast was, Oh my gosh, you know, how do we handle that? Because truth of matter is our requests, our inquiries are up. Our customers are up. People are thinking and planning ahead. You know, it's not just people who have passed, but you know, just future planning because people are scared. So Mm -hmm. it's hairy that that's for sure. But if you're going back to that end consumer and the person who's benefiting, Mm -hmm. that I think can avoid the whole tone death aspect. Absolutely. Agree. Agree wholeheartedly there. Yeah. At the end of the day, who who are you helping? Make make sure that you're always, always looking for the helpers. Maria, that's a great place to end. Absolutely. (laughs) I love it. Thanks for being on today. Thank you so much, Beck. I really appreciate it. This was fun. Thanks for listening to Dear Bank the advice podcast for PR and marketing pros like you. Our show is created by BAM, a PR and marketing agency headquartered in San Diego and New York City. The music you're enjoying today was composed by Tiffany Dizon, produced by Daniel Kessner, and played by San Diego Symphony's Art of Alarm. Thank you to our podcast production team at Citizen Reporting. If you have a tough PR and marketing question you'd like us to answer, please write to us at bamtheagency.com forward slash Dear Banff. Don't forget the F. We'll be back next Monday with another episode of Dear Banff. Until then.